Hello and welcome to this video on how to specify a strict measurement equivalence model with longitudinal data in the M plus software. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel, I present weekly statistics tutorials, usually related to structural equation modeling, factor analysis, latent class analysis, or multi-level modeling. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and to check out the description for additional resources, including a link to my free weekly stats newsletter, as well as additional videos and workshops. In this video here, I want to show you how you can specify and analyze a strict measurement equivalence model when running longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis. In an earlier video, I showed the new M plus feature for um, automated measurement equivalence testing with longitudinal data. And so one aspect that is currently missing from that option is to specify strict measurement equivalence. The automated tool in M plus currently only allows you to run the configurable metric and scalar invariance models, but not the strict measurement equivalence model. And sometimes that is something that we also want to test. What does strict measurement equivalence mean? With strict measurement equivalence, we have equal factor loadings across time, we have equal intercepts across time, and equal error variances also. And so that can be a useful model to test if your strong factorial invariance model already fits the data well. So if you find that you do have invariant loadings and invariant intercepts, then you could make your model even more parsimonious by also constraining the error variances to be equal across time. However, you wanna make sure that that is meaningful or that that fits your data well and is in line with your data. And so therefore, we should run this model first to check that it um, fits the data. So here I have an example where I manually implement the invariance constraints in the model and I'll point out how you could get the other invariance um, versions, meaning the metric and scalar or weak and strong measurement equivalence models by reducing some of this syntax here. So let's take a look at it. So in this data set, I have six variables, three for time one, and then the same three variables measured again at time two. So I have two latent factors, each with three indicators, where my first factor tau one indicates the true score variable or latent state variable, we could say, at time one, measured by y11, y21, and y31. And you can see that here I put these equality or parameter labels behind the second and the third indicator. And that was done so as to hold their loadings equal across time. In the by statement, we refer to the loadings. And so here with these parameter labels one and two in parentheses, I am referring to the factor loadings and I'm holding them equal across time. You can see that I gave the same parameter labels here for tau two for corresponding variables. And that will uh, cause M plus to set those factor loadings equal across time. Why do I not have to say anything for the first variable? So why is there no parameter label here for Y11 or Y12? The reason is that M plus automatic, automatically fixes the first loading after the by statement to one for each variable for identification. And that also implies measurement equivalence or invariance of these loadings across time, because if that loading is fixed to one at time one and also fixed to one at time two, then it also implies that the loading is equal over time. So this means for the first loading, we don't have to include a parameter label because it is fixed to one at each time point. Next are the intercepts. The intercepts are referred to in M plus by using brackets and then the variable names in the brackets. And so you can see that here I listed corresponding indicators in the same line of code in brackets so that I could simplify the equality constraint syntax. So when you put the variables that for which you want to hold the intercepts or other parameters equal 
across time in the same line of code, then you only have to give the label once. So here I gave the label three for the intercept of the first variable. So that will hold that intercept for y11 and y12 equal. So we'll set it equal across those two variables. And then the same thing for y21 and y22, y31 and y32, um, I gave them a label so that those intercepts will be constrained to be equal also. And then finally, I have my error variances here. So that then um, uh, gives us a strict invariance model if we have equal loadings, equal intercepts, and equal error variances. So here in this um, uh, input file, you can see that I did the same thing that I did for the intercepts. I put corresponding variables on the same line of code and gave a label before the semicolon. But in this case, I omitted the brackets. When you omit the brackets, then uh, M plus knows you're referring to the residual or error variances for endogenous variables or dependent variables. And in this model, the observed variables are dependent or endogenous variables because they depend on the factors here. The factors are the um, predictors, so to say, or independent variables of those um, outcome variables. So that sets the error variances equal. So in summary, we have a strict measurement equivalence model. If you wanted to only test strong invariance, then you would just simply delete those constraints here. Then you would have a strong or scalar invariance model. If you wanted to test only a weak or metric invariance model, you would uh, omit both the the constraints about the intercepts and the constraints about the error variances and then only the loadings would be set equal across time. The final command here in the model statement is about the latent means and so you can see that I, I fixed the first latent mean to zero by putting the, the names of the latent variables in brackets and then saying tau one at zero. So the first mean serves as reference and then the second mean is freely estimated as indicated here by the star. Normally M plus would constrain all means to zero for the factors. That's the default in M plus when you have latent variables that their means are zero unless you estimate a growth curve model or a multi-group model. But for regular CFA, um, no factor means are included by default. But here in this case, since we have equal intercepts over time and also equal loadings over time, we can identify a latent mean structure. And it makes sense because we might be interested in looking at mean differences across time. So kind of like a repeated measures t-test, so to say, but at the latent level. So we might care about whether there were any mean changes over time with regard to tau one and tau two. And so that allows us to do this in that um, specification, the first mean is kept at zero and so serves as the reference or comparison mean. The second mean is freely estimated and so then we can study the extent to which the second mean is different from zero. So the mean for tau two gives us the mean difference, so to say indirectly or directly actually. So because the first mean is set to zero and so then we can look at um, whether and by how much the second mean is different from zero and whether that's statistically significant and then that gives us a test for mean differences across time. Let's take a look at the output file and at the fit statistics first, you can see that the chi-square test of model fit here looks excellent. The model is not rejected by the chi-square test of model fit, the p-value is not significant. So this model fits the data well and the other fit statistics also look decent. So we can interpret the parameters and we can check first of all whether the equality constraints were properly implemented by M plus. You can see here the loading for the second indicator is estimated to be 0.625 at time one and also 0.625 at time two with the exact same standard error. So that indicates that this parameter was properly held equal across time. And so was the third loading, uh, which here was 0 0.063 and 0 0.063 also at time two. 
We can also check this for the intercepts and we should. So you can see here we have the intercepts of time one and the ones that are estimated for time two are the exact same for corresponding variables. And then finally, also the residual variances were estimated to be exactly equal across time, as you can see here. Now, one interesting feature about this model was the specification of the means for the latent variables. You can see the mean for tau one was fixed at zero. So it serves as the reference mean. And the second mean was estimated as a free parameter and it was barely larger than 0 0.025, indicating that um, there wasn't much mean change. And in fact, um, it wasn't a significant amount of change. You can see here that the p-value in the last column is almost 1.0. So the null hypothesis of um, the null hypothesis that this parameter is zero in the population is not rejected here. In other words, there was no significant increase in the means um, from time one to time two in this example here. What else can we see from this model? We can take a look at the factor variances. So those also look similar. So there wasn't apparently any uh, meaningful increase or decrease in inter-individual differences at the latent level. We could also test this. We could set those variances equal to study whether um, there was significant, there's a significant difference. So we could run another model where those variances are set equal and then um, look at whether that leads to a decline in model fit here. It doesn't look like it because those variances also look um, pretty similar. And then in the standardized solution, one interesting parameter to look at is the factor correlation between time one and time two. You can see here this correlation is very high, indicating that there was a great stability of inter-individual differences across time. So individuals who scored highly at time one also tended to score highly at time two. And those who didn't score highly at time one also didn't tend to score highly at time two. So there was a great stability of the ordering of individuals with regard to this construct, indicating that this was a stable construct or trait-like construct, maybe something like intelligence, where we find high correlations across time, high stability of um, performance differences across time. I hope you found this video useful to learn about how to specify a longitudinal CFA model with strict measurement equivalence in the M plus software. If you did, then please subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, and don't forget to check out the description for additional resources, including other videos and workshops. And I'll see you next time.